So Daniel, thank you for joining me. I know you've been hugely busy over the last few days. You're probably a familiar face to many people on the channel, and maybe people aren't aware that you've been deeply involved with the response to this pandemic from the medical side, from the economic side, liaising with institutions and agencies. And we, we're going to cover here like the situational assessment. Where are we at right now? And what is the really crucial information that people need to know and act on right now? Yeah, thank you, David. Um, <clears throat> so we are recording on March 21st. I'm saying that because we're going to be giving a real-time assessment and also uh, recommendations. And many of these recommendations will have already happened and will be on to new things. And the assessment will have changed a few days from now. So uh, much of this information is um, rapidly changing. Uh, also, as a preface, not a medical doctor, so I'm not giving medical advice here. I am working with a number of groups seeking to get good information and good response across us. So as a source of preface. Um, we'll start with a kind of situation assessment and then what a risk assessment of how the situation could unfold based on unknowns and different response uh, types would be, and then response recommendations, and then some brief notes on the background situation that has brought us here and what the kind of bigger picture responses need to be for systemic fragility and catastrophic risk at large. <clears throat> I'll start with just a quick note on the nature of bias in assessing things like this because most everyone has seen a range of responses from this is no big deal, it's just a flu, uh, to this is the end of the world as we know it. And so obviously most of those responses are not particularly clearly informed, but even amongst the clearly informed things, the curves can be very different based on how we respond. And there's a lot of unknown still. We don't know if getting the in infection and recovering will confer immunity to where you don't get it again, or if you don't get it for uh, across what range of changes in mutation. Um, so given that there's also a lot of unknowns, including uh, confounding variables that could occur, you do get a pretty wide range of estimates. So I'm going to speak to, in the risk assessment, some of the things that could go pretty badly if we don't respond well. Not because that is definitely how it's going to go, but because it could go that way if we don't respond preventatively. Now, this is a tricky thing. Anytime someone is in the position of trying to do anticipatory response is that it is the job in doing anticipatory risk mitigation to assess the scenarios we don't want to have happen to propose remedies to prevent them from happening. Then people who have status quo bias afterwards will say, see, it was overblown hype. Those things didn't happen, but they only didn't happen because we made the responses. So the, uh, the scenarios I'm going to suggest hopefully don't happen, but they could. And in order to not happen, they need us to take them seriously and respond in a way that prevents them. And then after the fact, we'll say, see, look, they didn't happen because we responded well. So this is a really key aspect of bias that's important. Now, we have a situation where we have to act without complete knowledge. The time that it takes to get complete knowledge, the underlying situation is changing. So inaction is also a kind of action, right? There is a consequence to action and inaction. And the action is not uh, inconsequential no matter what. Uh, doing nationwide quarantines has a massive effect on people's mental health, on the underlying economy, on lots of things. And not doing it has a massive effect. And so uh, we're not taking any of that trivially. trivially. What we're going to do is, given what the unknowns are and what the knowns are, what are the various scenarios factoring the second and third and fourth order effects? How bad do they get? And what are the responsible approaches to take that maintain optionality for us to continue to make better responses as we get better information and as we get better capabilities? That's it for the prefaces. So diving into situational assessment. Um, I think 
many people have a clearer sense of the real risk here than they had even a couple days ago because the awareness of the actual risk portended is getting clearer in terms of um, obviously the U.S. government and the U.K. government starting to change their position. The paper that came out from the um, Imperial College affected the positions of both of those countries from let's just kind of let everybody get it herd immunity type approaches to, oh, that actually is going to be catastrophic and won't work and we have to be serious about social distancing and quarantine. There are still a lot of people who think that the risk of quarantine is worse than the risk of not and that the viral risk itself is overblown. And that's one of the things that I want to address. So we'll, we'll start right there. So comparing the death rates to the flu and seeing that a lot less people have died and then thinking that it's overblown and it's um, some kind of either state agenda to concentrate control or mass hysteria or something like that. The number of people that die from the flu every year is one, it's a baseline that we always have. So looking at elevation from baseline is a critical factor because that's changing a, the way that society functions. Two, because it's a baseline we've had every year, we have ICU capability for that. We don't have ICU capability for spikes above that. And that's where we start getting catastrophic collapse of the medical system that leads to much worse problems. Three, during a flu season, most people get it. Um, very high percentage of people get it because we don't try to stop the spread because it's not that fatal. Not, not that high a percentage of total people die, not that high a percentage of people even need hospitalized. So we don't take very serious measures to prevent its spread. So if a similar number of people got COVID-19 as got the flu, the death numbers would be catastrophically higher because the percentage of people that need hospitalized and go into critical condition and the percentage of people that die, even factoring the whole range of what that can be, is radically higher. The total number of people exposed so far is tiny compared to the flu, but it won't stay tiny if you don't do containment. It is spreading enough that if you don't contain it, you could get saturation. You'd get saturation in about two months, meaning a 60, 70% of the population has it globally from where we currently are if containment efforts didn't get put in place. Containment efforts can, of course, slow that curve and even stop the curve, depending upon the nature of the containment, which will make the total number of infected people and thus hospitalized people and deaths much, much lower. Also, in calculating fatalities, um, it takes a while from the time that someone is exposed for them to expose other people and expose other people to get to the people who are going to be most vulnerable. It takes a while from the time someone was exposed for them to show symptoms, from the time they show symptoms to get serious enough to go to the hospital, and from the time they go to the hospital to when they die. So there's a lot of people who are early in that curve who are not yet being recorded as fatalities, but will. And so comparing the fatalities right now to the flu is like a whole bunch of statistical mistakes at once. Um, that's just one important thing to factor. If, if you got to that, say, 60, 70% um, infection rate as you get with the flu, what, ju just a comparison, what would the death rate be? There's a few numbers that really matter. It, R0 and CFR are the two that most people are focusing. R0 is each person that gets it, how many other people will get it from them. And CFR is case fatality rate of the total people who are infected, how many die. Um, the other number that I think is critically important that is not quite as popular being tracked is of the total number of people who get it, how many need hospitalized, how many have to go to ICU. That ends up being really critical because of the um, much larger percentage that, that are hospitalized than die, the uh, downstream effects of that are very profound and we have to factor them. All three of those numbers are variables. They are not fixed just by the nature of the virus themselves. So uh, they're very affected by the social response, social and institutional response. So regarding the R0 number, when we say the R0 is two or two and a half or whatever it is, 
this is a statistical average. First, it's a guess based on not knowing the actual number of infected cases because we aren't testing enough to know the actual number of infected cases. Um, and it's an average across people who stay at home and don't interact with anyone and people who are riding the subway and interacting with everyone and are in a lot of contact and would be what we'd call super spreaders. So someone might infect a thousand people and someone else might infect no people, right? So averages are very misleading because someone can say, okay, two and a half people for me, but particularly young, healthy people who don't think they're at risk of dying. And so they're like, I can take a risk of getting this more than I can take the risk of missing, making money or whatever it is might continue to. And especially if they stay because of being relatively healthy, low symptom for a very long period of time while being infectious, they could be super spreaders to a lot of people. So it's important. Oh, the other thing with regard to R naught that we have to understand is it's so obviously that's averaged and some people will spread much more than others, but also this topic of portal pathways, being able to spread it to a critically sensitive community or spread it to other people who will become super spreaders or who would have otherwise been unaffected. So it's not, it's not just like how many people did you spread it to, but did you spread it somewhere that actually is a really big deal getting there versus not getting there. So for instance, vulnerable populations like senior living facilities, uh, the death rate is also averaged across populations who mostly all won't die versus that have very high mortality rates. So the mortality rate in a senior care facility of people who are both older and have comorbidities is extremely high. And so let's say one of the workers who's going in there, whether it is a nurse or a janitor or whatever is infected, they don't know that they're infected because there's not enough testing, they're asymptomatic, it spreads in there. The fatality can that occurs from that would be very profound. Um, if a worker goes into a prison or into a homeless facility or into doing uh, social care work in Skid Row in a ma major homeless area, if those areas could be totally quarantined right now and protected from getting it, we'd be much, much better off because if they get it, it's extraordinarily hard to prevent it from spreading. And when we already don't have enough uh, intubation equipment and ICU capabilities, those aren't, aren't the first places it's going to go. So um, we have to factor not just super spreaders, but portal pathways. Research patient 31 in South Korea. South Korea basically had it contained. Then one person who wasn't contained was in lots of uh, social connection and all of the other cases that happened there are believed to have occurred from that one person. So, um, yeah, this is a place where we're not just factoring ourselves, we're factoring the spread and the civic responsibility associated with it. So the infection rate is a massive variable and we can change it. That's the first thing. The number of people or the percentage of people who get infected, who have to go to the hospital is a massive variable and who die is a massive variable. So we see that the death rate, the fatality rate, and none of these numbers are perfect because this is total cases um, in ratio to the death cases, but we don't have total cases right anywhere because we're not doing enough testing anywhere and the countries aren't doing similar types and uh, amounts of testing. So the statistics are again misleading. But it looks like the best numbers are, say, in South Korea, and the worst numbers are, say, in Iran or Italy in terms of fatality. So South Korea's got like a 0.5% fatality of the total number of people that get it, less than half a percent or around a half a percent, maybe up to about a percent die. Whereas you might have like five, six, seven percent, depending upon how we factor the statistics, dying in some other places. Um, partly this is going to have to do with uh, the susceptibility of the communities that are getting hit. Obviously, Seattle had a very high case fatality rate because it hit senior a senior home to begin with, right? So that's going to start high. But it's also very much the result of the response. So if you do early diagnostics, not only can you do smart containment and prevent the spread, you can start early treatment. And early treatment means that the chance of severe infection, um, 
is going to go down radically. So this is a novel virus, meaning it's not a previous human virus. And so we don't have uh, innate immunity to it. And we don't already have developed either vaccines or drug treatments, but we're obviously the whole world is mobilizing on its learning curve as fast as possible. So it was found out that chloroquine seems effective. Hydroxychloroquine seems more effective with less side effects. The hydroxychloroquine and zithromycin combo is looking quite effective, but it's not inconsequential. There's retinopathy effects, there's heart effects. So um, there's also limited supply of hydroxychloroquine. There's already people who depend upon that med to live who have lupus who are having a hard time getting it, which then starts to cause death from other reasons, right? Or um, not just death, but uh, hospitalization and health issues and whatever. There's research being done on lots of antivirals that are looking promising and on cytokine inhibitors and on ACE2 modulators on plasma antibody transfers. So I don't think that the world has ever had a situation where we medically learned as fast as is happening now. This is another reason to want to slow the curve radically because we are much less well prepared today than we will be each day that passes for dealing with this as we're learning more. But already a lot of doctors are treating with hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin and other things like that, and even just getting on fluids. And But let's say that you get to treat with those drugs early on. Most of those people won't have to go to the ICU, even the same people that would have had to go to the ICU otherwise. And uh, many of the people that will have to go to the hospital won't need intubated and won't die. And so early diagnostics and early treatment also change the curve of the illness for people who do get infected. Um, also, early diagnostics changes the curve of how many other people they infect, right? So you can have a situation where a very high percentage of the total population who gets infected will end up having to go to the ICU, right? Like 20% of the population. You could have a situation where almost nobody has to go to the ICU, because we're testing ubiquitously and getting good treatments to people. So it's important to understand how variable that is. And the same with death rates. It is not true that this is only a serious illness for old people with comorbidities. It is mostly only fatal for people who are older or have comorbidities so far. But half of the people in Italy who are on intubation, which means a tube in your lungs keeping you alive, are under 60. Half of them are. And if they didn't have access to that equipment, then they wouldn't stay alive, many of them. And so it's important to understand that part of why the fatality rates are lower is because they're depending upon life support systems, that if those life support systems went out, the fatality would go way up. Now, Italy's already got to the situation where they don't have enough respirators and ICU capability for everyone, so they're triaging it. So some people are just being let to die because they don't have any other options. So then the death percentage goes way up, right? That's the single biggest thing that affects the percentage of people that die is the overwhelm of ICU capabilities. And then people can't get treated for coronavirus and so they die. Also, you can have a situation where the hospital is overwhelmed so people can't get treated for the normal stuff where we save people's lives from heart attacks and strokes and ambulances are taking a long time to get to places and bleeding wounds and all those other things. Uh, so it's important to understand that all of those numbers regarding the spread of the infection, the number of people that get hospitalized, the number of people that die are all variable. We can change all of them. And the recommendations we're going to share are how to make those numbers lower. But those numbers can all go radically high if we don't respond appropriately. We could have a spread go all the way to saturation. We could overwhelm the ICUs, if, or we will if that happens. The death rate goes very high. That's not to mention yet what the follow-on effects uh, on the infrastructure and national security and the economy and other things will be, <clears throat> but um, just even factoring that. So now, shall we get into secondary effects? Sure. Yeah. So this much has not been clear to everyone. It's still not clear to everyone, but it's starting to get clearer. And um, you had someone on the other day who's written some really brilliant articles on these things. Uh, Poye, is that his name? Uh, Thomas Poyo, yes. Poyo, yeah. Yeah. Read his articles; they're very good, um, and you know that kind of information is starting to get clearer. 
The next step we have to look at is, let's say that we look at the health effects on people as first order effects. These are the virus direct action. First, actually before I get to second order effects, let's address some of the unknowns here. Will immunity be conferred? Don't know. And so as far as herd immunity type questions, we do not know enough to be able to make those assessments yet. <laughs> because, and so again, this is as of March 21st. A few days from now, we might know more. Um, there are cases in, in China and Japan of people who were diagnosed with COVID-19 who got better and then who got it again. Did they for sure get all the way better and then got reinfected exogenously? Or did they not get rid of the virus all the way and then it recirculated in their system? Or was the secondary exposure some other thing like a normal flu or whatever? We don't know yet. It's not clear enough. Also, there are antibody responses for the people who are um, getting sick and then getting better. But what is that antibody response actually going to do? What is it priming? We also just don't know yet. So it's could it is the antibody response such that next time someone is exposed to the virus, even in high viral load, they'll get no symptoms at all. Their body will fight it off so quickly they get no symptoms. Maybe that'd be awesome. Do they get symptoms but less severely because their body fights it quicker? Or do they actually get a worse case because people actually die from the immune response, right? They die from a cytokine storm from the inflammatory response that happens that ends up overwhelming the lungs and other um other organs, so uh, interleukin-6 primarily and TNF-alpha, there's drugs that are working to block those, but <clears throat> could it be that the antibody response primes a cytokine storm? That's been speculated. We just don't know yet because we don't have a lot of people who've gotten better and we know they got better. We've tested that there's zero viral load and then they're re-exposed. Then let's say that someone does have immunity. Will everyone have the same immunity or will it be that people who have more compromised immune systems are primed for cytokine storm and other people are primed to actually have good responses. There's probably going to be a Gaussian distribution of the type of response that occurs or there could very well be, right? The next question is how long will the immunity last? Will it last for a couple of years, which would be really helpful as it did in SARS or is the mutation such that the antibodies last only for a couple months, in which case this thing keeps circulating? Um, we don't know. Again, we don't have that kind of long-term data. The other thing is that the virus is mutating and how wide of a mutation will the antibodies protect against even if they are protective is a question, right? So as we know with the Spanish flu situation, it wasn't the first round that killed the most people. It was the second round. So let's even say we got herd immunity. We know that we don't get herd immunity against the flu permanently, it every year kills a bunch more people, right? And we know that even if we vaccinate against it, the vaccine is not good against the mutation. So uh, we have a similar situation here. Let's say that we didn't control this adequately and it's with us every year like the flu now, but on top of the flu, but with a much higher fatality and it reaches saturation numbers, then we could look at this being a meaningfully population decreasing phenomena. So let's say you get to uh, saturation, 70% of the people are infected and 2% of them die, or because 70% are infected and it overwhelms the ICUs, 5% of the people die. Calculate those on country by country basis or global basis. Those are tremendously huge numbers, right? So that's a, there are numbers like 1 million, there's numbers like 10 million in the U S based on exactly how those, what the death rates are and how those curves happen, but they're I think the number of soldiers that died in Vietnam over 11 years was 50,000 or something like that. So you can look at the multiples we're looking at. So we don't yet know about whether immunity will be adequately conferred. We don't yet know about the rate and the severity of the mutations and if the follow on mutations will be more or less lethal. We don't yet know what the long-term health effects of uh, contracting this are. So we know that viruses don't just go away permanently. In many cases, they go into chronic phases. So someone gets herpes and they can continue to get herpes, right? They get HPV warts and they can continue to get warts um, and they can continue to become 
uh, infectious when that happens. We know that with other infections, you get chicken pox, you don't get it again for a long time, but then you get shingles. Um, and then for some things like say mono, then you still have low grade Epstein bar that can increase likelihoods for cancers and chronic fatigue syndrome and things like that. So what are, is, is there going to be a chronic health implication of this in addition to the existing chronic viruses that are already part of the health care system? This is again, also a totally not known topic. And then the people who get a serious illness, but don't die, the, CT scans of their lungs show very serious damage to their lungs. Some of them are showing damage to the heart, cardiomyopathy, and other um, body systems. So might there be lasting damage that affects the duration of that person's life, even for people who, um, and I mean not via the viral or immunological process, but the tissue damage processes. Well, we know that tissue damage is occurring of the type that normally is is lasting. Obviously what that looks like two or three years later, we don't yet know, but that should all tell people that this is not something to take lightly and that there's a good bit of unknown. Also just look at a video of someone on intubation and who's got to be intubated for weeks. Like that's such an undesirable thing to experience, even if it doesn't kill you. Um, and mm -hmm. again, the fact that half of the people in Italy on intubation are under 60. So that's a little bit more just on the medical effects, right? Okay. So let's say that that is all looking at kind of just the direct virus acting on human physiology. So now we look at second order effects and we say, okay, so what is the effect on the medical system from spikes well beyond the capacity of what ICUs are set up for? So, it's expensive to run hospitals. It's expensive to run intensive care units and to train lots of doctors and whatever to just be sitting around waiting for surges. <clears throat> so hospitals and ICUs run pretty close to full capacity for financial efficiency, which means that really big surges are things that they're not well prepared for. Some things can be upregulated fairly quickly. Some things can't. Like it's not very easy to build a lot more respirators in a hurry or to train a lot more doctors in a hurry. So um, if the number of people who are going to ICUs is within the capacity that the ICU can scale up to, the death percentages will stay relatively low. If it exceeds it and the ICU has to start triaging who gets treated and who doesn't, the number of deaths, the percentage of deaths is going to go way up. So let's say that the number of people that are going in is 2x what the ICUs are prepared for and they can get people in the hallways and whatever. Okay, that's one thing. But what if it's 10x or more? This is where you start seeing what you're seeing in Italy and, uh, you know, and worse, where it's just people just can't be treated. Now, besides the fact that most of the hospitals in the U.S. are already running low on personal protective equipment or don't even have it, and doctors are putting themselves and nurses are putting themselves at huge personal risk, the rate of doctors and nurses getting sick is estimated at something like 2 to 5x what the rate of everybody else is, and they're the people who most critically can't get sick. Um, and there's not enough ICU beds, there's not enough intubation equipment, there's not enough of the tests of the hydroxychloroquine of the whatever, right? Various things. Um, doctor, a friend of mine in LA told me something like, currently there's 150 beds in ICU left in LA, there's 10 million people in LA, and let's just look at what any percentage of saturation looks like. Um, and what any reasonable percentage of that having to go to ICU is. And it's like, oh, that, that can look terrible in a hurry, right? So what happens if our doctors and nurses are getting sick? And we saw a couple thousand healthcare workers in China get sick, right? And China did a good job of containing it to one area, which we haven't. We now have cases in all 50 states. They were able to mostly quarantine Hubei province and Wuhan and have the spread outside much less because of their drastic, rapid, intense response. Um, and also, even if the doctors and nurses don't get sick, just wearing them out because they're trying to save lives running so many shifts. Go look at the videos of people in ICU in Seattle 
in Italy and just kind of get a sense of what that looks like and read some of the letters that doctors in Italy are writing um, that are kind of sharing their experience. So you start to have a collapse of the healthcare system. And now this has all kinds of cascading consequences for um, death from all other kinds of things and chronic health implications and whatever. All right, next. So let's say we try to institute a quarantine and people don't want to participate. And so we have to have the National Guard and the police roll out to try to initiate it. If you look at the videos from South Korea and China and Hong Kong, you'll see that the police and the National Guard equivalents are all wearing hazmat gear. And the doctors and the nurses and the people doing the sanitizing and picking up the trash are all in pretty intensive degrees of personal protective equipment and the very front line high exposure ones are in hazmat gear. To the best of my knowledge and pretty active communication about this, neither the US nor the UK have that much gear, nor do they have the training to be able to get that to the frontline people that would need to have it. So obviously we have to find where the surplus is, get it to the most critical people in triage, get the training up and produce more kind of instantly. Because one of the things you'll notice about many of those jobs is that they have very high contact with each other, right? Police are riding in a truck together. They're in a locker room together, National Guard, et cetera, first responders. And because of the long asymptomatic period, two to 21 days asymptomatic, and some cases actually recover while being quite low symptoms. So you can be spreading that entire time and we don't have you know, testing out. Uh, so what happens if a significant percentage of the police start to get sick or the National Guard or military or prison guards or the people who run the utilities, the critical utilities or the supply chains? You can start to get now, here's the cascading kind of third order failures. And these are much, much worse risks than the virus, right? So um, obviously everyone can't go on quarantine because for most people to be able to stay home, the electricity has to stay on and the water has to stay on. The internet has to stay on. They have to have some way that either the supermarkets have some triaged version of staying open or delivery mechanisms happen in the pharmacies. So there's a number of people whose jobs are required to basically mediate societal function and not having societal collapse. All of those people need to get personal protective equipment and or hazmat gear based on the degree of exposure they have and they need to get training for how to use it and they need to have insurement of payment so they don't go on strike. This is not the time we need our trash. Uh, uh, the people that do trash um, uh, sanitization engineers getting sick or going on strike, right? Where then you start to get additional um, health plague type issues associated with trash piling up or any critical utilities or whatever uh, starting to have problems. But that could happen, right? And we already see, we saw in Italy certain prisons being overtaken by the prisoners because of this situation, either because the prison guards didn't want to go to work or got sick or various things like that. Now, the U.S. has a much higher percentage of its total population in prison than any other country. Uh, the prisons are going to be highly vulnerable to the spread if it happens inside of there, and they know they won't be the first people to get intubated. So what does that mean for the mindset of, you know, people in there? These are just, these are serious follow-on effects that really have to be thought about and then addressed anticipatorily. Now, we also have confounding effects, which are independent variables, but that also affect the overall situation. Uh, the floods are starting in the U.S. And that's a normal thing. We get floods in the rainy season, but <clears throat> how do the droplets of this disease spread in water scenarios where everybody's walking around in um, ankle deep or knee deep water? Uh, how do you do containment and quarantine when you're having to move people because of floods? How does that affect the redirection of um, medical and first responders, you know, those types of things, right? We also had a little earthquake in Utah that was just a wake up of like, oh, the rest of the normal disasters don't go on hold. So, you know, as we come into summer and we think about what California's wildfire season was like um, last year, 
and think about, okay, so what happens where you got a quarantine and then the wildfires start or Florida hurricane season or whatever, right? So we also have to think about the rest of general preparedness in those issues and where we started to get quarantined down and now we lose quarantine because of some other issue and or can't respond. So we get worse death tolls or infrastructure collapse because our responders are already purposed somewhere else or sick or ta taxed or something like that, right? <clears throat> now we start to look at the political effects. Could we have a situation where the country's on quarantine during the elections for the US? Yeah. Do we have digital voting that is secure and ready to go where people can vote from at home? No, not currently. And what it would take to get there, we have no precedent for. We also have no precedent for a plague, you know, a, a pandemic during voting. If we get, if, if to ensure that people go and vote, do we increase the pandemic spread and have a spike during that time and then, you know, have a whole additional spike to deal with? Does this change the demographics of who's available to go uh, significantly. So there's a whole big serious set of questions there. Obviously, the uh, economic situation, we've seen trillions of dollars of loss since this has started in the uh, stock market. And if you take for the US or the UK or any country or the world, um, you take the GDP per month. And you say, okay, under quarantine, people are staying home. We're not just looking at a um, effect of asset classes because of trading and fear and whatever. And we're not just looking at the effect of on <clears throat> uh, airlines and a few industries, but all of the restaurants and all of the, you know, sporting and cruises and in-person type things, small businesses, everything under quarantine. So we're looking at not just a effect on the financial sector, but on the actual real economics of productivity itself and supply and demand type dynamics themselves. So then we get, what, a decrease of by 30% under quarantine or 40% or whatever of actual GDP capacity. So look at what the GDP of the US, for instance, per month is. Look at losing 30 or 40% of that per month and the idea that that's what has to be subsidized just for break even type effects, not mentioning the up ramping ICU's capabilities and diagnostic capabilities and things like that. <clears throat> or international aid, which brings us to the next topic. There's a lot more in economics, by the way. 70% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck and can't afford to be quarantined for a while, so they will push to want to keep working and you know, spread infection. For them to be able to stay home is going to require economic support and stimulus packages, which are already in discussion, which is really good, which should be um, suspension of rent and mortgage payments and either a UBI or some kind of food and medicine provisioning type capabilities. Uh, there's going to need to be protection for small businesses so there doesn't have to be massive laying off of people because if you have bankruptcy and collapse of small businesses, they can't rebuild themselves that quickly. There's a learning curve to be able to rebuild things. So it's like, you know, when you clear cut a forest, you don't get a new forest back right away. Um, and so there's a lot in the economic space um, that has to be addressed. The geopolitical space is actually where my biggest concerns are. So I'll share a scenario. It's not the only scenario. So we see already Saudi Arabia doing and Russia in this, you know, oil um, price gouging kind of scenario, and that could play out all kinds of weird ways. So there's lots of different scenarios that could occur, but let's specifically focus on U.S.-China relations and overall geopolitical placement. First, let's look at what the epidemiology for the whole world could be, because we don't know. Originally, there was a hope that this would follow seasonality and either let up a bunch in the summer and or as a result of temperature effects not really hit warm countries as much. We now see it spreading rapidly in Brazil and in other warmer Asian places. And so that hope has been kind of uh, thwarted. It looks like there are, aren't any places that are unsusceptible. So there are places that are earlier in the curve and later in the curve and some places that haven't been reached yet. But um, unless some kind of massive measures are taken to not be reached, then they will. So specifically, what happens when India gets hit? 
China has a huge population, but they didn't have to quarantine their whole population. They had to do some measures across the whole population, but they were able to contain to a province pretty strongly. Um, what does India do with very high total population, very high population density, very high interaction, low ICU per capita capabilities, um, low relative hygiene capabilities for lots of the population? And just imagine like, okay, if we don't protect against transmission there, what happens? Same with Mexico City, right? Same with Lagos, same with a number of places, Bangladesh, that have high populations multiplied by population density without good preparedness capacities. Okay, so now we see, and we see that first world countries are getting destroyed, right? We see that Italy um, is in that position and, and that other European countries, right? Merkel said probably 70% of the country is going to get infected eventually, like the very serious kinds of things. We see what's happening to the EU as a result of this, since the EU is not um, actually supporting Italy and not able to support Eastern European countries, and then China stepping in to offer help. So now China was on the front of this curve, which also, and they took very strong responses. So they are the furthest ahead of being able to offer international aid in response. China was already the place that did most of the manufacturing of medical equipment in the first place. And so in one way of looking at it, and China got a massive economic hit and there were lots of companies that wanted to pull manufacturing out of China, which could be a massive, very long-term hit for China since export is such a huge part of their business. Um, it affected overall you know, public sentiment towards them. So in some ways they got hit very hard, but on other ways, you know, it's just two months later and they're starting to loosen quarantine, no new cases in Wuhan, and they're um, opening Apple stores and Starbucks stores throughout the country again, right? Plus offering um, masks and ventilators and training and aid um, and, you know, medical knowledge and equipment to places that need it. So we've seen that in Italy. We've seen it in some Eastern European places. We saw it to the EU as a whole. So in some ways, China's in a stronger position than it's ever been because they're on the other side of this. They mobilized into a crisis wartime response type mode and they have the medical response equipment and those types of things. They were already geopolitically very savvy with the Belt and Road Initiative and all of the work they were doing to be able to get international support and coordination for their geopolitical agendas. The U.S. appears to be moving into one of the weakest positions it has been in, in a very long time. And because of not having early strong response and we can't just do specialized quarantines because there are some people in all 50 states and we don't have the diagnostics ready, could we be in a very vulnerable position for a long time? We've heard UK and US federal governments both talk about 18 months now after the paper that came out from Imperial College talking about that. <clears throat> so what happens if China's in a very strong position, US in a weak position, and uh, could they start dumping U.S. Treasury bonds? Could they start with cyber attacks? Whatever. Not just them. Lots of state actors, non-state actors, right? Do we have – if the police are redirected, then where does that open up criminality? If the government's attention is damaged or redirected, where does that open up vulnerabilities? That's obviously going to happen everywhere, but – there's not as many places in the world that would have predatory opportunism for Italy as they'd have for the U S right. Um, or the UK, but particularly look at kind of superpower tensions here. And, but there's a thing that isn't direct war, which is just China being able to do a good job of offering international aid in exchange for joining the belt and road initiative. And then, oh, by the way, dollars are really dirty and transmit coronavirus. Let's move to digital currency. Oh, by the way, we have a digital currency. Let's roll it out. Um, and or you can only get our aid in the digital currency or that was already something that was being considered and in the works. I was a, turned on to this originally by Alex Gladstein from the Human Rights Foundation. Um, that uh, there's a bunch of countries that were already 
fully dependent upon Chinese infrastructure, like the, being the only telecom in many countries, and obviously the kind of predatory debt lending for um, fundamental infrastructure, where they could say, we will now only accept payment in our unique payment portal, but because it's a government-sponsored digital payment, there's no anonymity to the money at all, right? So there's there's no separation between the private sector and the public sector. There's no anonymous cash. There's a perfectly uh, monitorable financial surveillance apparatus <clears throat> that would also become a world currency, world reserve currency, if it became the primary one used or could. So I want the U.S. to ramp up its capability to respond to this domestically and to shore up its vulnerabilities against all of the kinds of national security threats and attacks and whatever that can happen during this time and ramp up its ability to start offering international aid. I would like the UK and the US to partner in that and you know, for everyone else who would be in the right place to, to um, look at partnering in that. And we're nowhere close to that, but we could. It would require a World War II level mobilization, full court press on the capability to do it. We see that the private sector has offered involvement already. We see that China's private sector has, right? So Jack Ma saying that he'll get the um, personal protective equipment and other key things needed for the U.S. <clears throat> but we also see Facebook and Google and Walmart and Walgreens and you know lots of U.S. corporations. We see that Elon said uh, that he'd ramp up ability to make um, ventilators if needed. I would really like to see capabilities of companies like Elon's conscripted to not just ramp up ventilators for the U.S. need, but also to be able to export international aid for the geopolitical position that that represents. Um, <clears throat> I also want to be very careful that in, in engaging the private sector, uh, the companies that are most capable of helping in the private sector, the ones that already had too much power and were almost monopolies. So Amazon has amazing logistics capabilities to get everything to people's door while they're under quarantine. And they were already basically became the market, right? Facebook has an amazing ability to do contact tracing, where if anyone is infected, we can probably see everyone who they were engaged with and be able to help predict where the curves are going to hit the ICUs. But we don't want to turn those abilities on and then leave them on forever. So we have to be able to engage the private sector in a way that engages their capacities but doesn't collapse democracy and have regulatory capture even more as a result of it and data capture, which is where we can neither be slow in our response here because of the rate of doubling, nor can in our fastness we be hasty and make dumb moves, which means extremely smart, fast sense-making and coordination is absolutely needed. So there's a lot more examples that we could give. We haven't even talked about what the mental health crisis consequences are going to be, the change in social fabric are going to be, what is the effect of the total number of old people that die on social grieving and family structures, what is the uh, a whole generation of kids all missing school at the same time. Like there's a lot of things to factor here. How many marriages only stay together because the people avoid each other most of the time? <clears throat> um, and, you know, on quarantine, when the kids stay home from school and they have two parents who normally work, now one of them has to stay home and the dad's a utility worker and the mom's a nurse and neither of them can stay home. And like this, all these types of things to consider. I mean, you've just outlined a few of the effects of the, of the quarantine. So some people might be thinking, well, is the quarantine worse than the, um, than the disease itself? Mm -mm. Not even close. Um, having, if herd immunity occurs, which we don't know, it needs to occur slow enough that it doesn't overwhelm the ICUs, which means we still have to do everything we can to stop the spike from ICU overwhelm. If the herd immunity doesn't occur, all the more we want to stop the ICU and stop people from getting it because it doesn't even help to get it and get over with it. And we need to be able to ramp up the diagnostics and the early treatments that are going to be able to be the actual longer term answer. Um, lo losing a bunch of our doctors and nurses having collapse of critical infrastructure, having uh, so much national damage that's occurring from the uh, death tolls that we become more vulnerable to attacks of various kinds. Uh, we've already seen increase in um, kind of coordinated disinfo attacks that look to be state actor um, and some non-state actor attacks and cyber attacks. 
No. Uh, think about it like frame control, right? From a kind of theory of war place, we would much rather voluntarily quarantine and not, and have the people that are needed to run critical stuff still be healthy and able to run the critical stuff. Then they're sick and they can't, and we can't respond if we want to. And now we're on the defense of whatever else is coming. Right. So to have frame control of this, you absolutely want to be able to respond anticipatorily. And 18 months of quarantine would be really, really bad. But two or three months, people can live with people like churches need to come together and say, we're not going to come together physically, but we're going to make sure that everyone who's lonely is getting talked to on the phone and we're doing Skype calls and we're doing you know, spiritual, psychological support. We're making sure that the people who don't have resources and the older vulnerable people are getting the resources. We're being used as hubs to, you know, provision the gear. Um, there's, there's lots of things that can be done to be able to support. So here's the proposal that I recommend that I would like to see happen. I would like to see for the U.S., and I, I don't know the U.K. situation as well, but I believe it's probably quite similar. I would like to see a total nationwide quarantine immediately, effective immediately. And what that means is if you don't have a job that societal function requires you to go out to work for, then you stay home. So if you run utilities or critical supply chain or um, first responder or whatever, then you need to get – then the government has to be able to provision personal protective equipment and hazmat gear and training to all of those people. The training is critical because even if you have the gear and you use it the tiniest bit wrong, touch the outside of something while you're removing it, then it's completely worthless. And uh, this is again, a situation where the money that was cut to the CDC and office of pandemics and like that was really disastrous because we need more of these people to have been trained already and to have gear already and to have earlier response capacity and better coordination. Had we responded early, we would have had a, a curve more like Hong Kong's, right? Shut down the borders, tend to the first few people that are sick, and that's it, right? Um, then you have a South Korea type case where a lot of people get infected. But you, so you can't just kind of prevent anyone from getting infected, but you respond very strong. You do the quarantines, you do the personal protective equipment and the sanitizing and the social distancing, and you do the very strong uh, diagnostics early on and the tracing, and you have the curve flatten very steeply. And it's important to understand that South Korea is a democracy. This isn't a only totalitarian autocracies can do draconian measures. And the draconian measures will seem very humane and sane compared to like tiny little Italy. Italy is the size of not China, but the Hubei province has already had more people die than China. And it's still early in their curve. So that actually should be seen as radically inhumane to not respond quickly. And I mean, we're not seeing these responses yet in, I mean, the UK and the US, for example, and, and generally, why do you think that is? What do you think it is that people are not getting? Is it the nature of the exponential curve or what's, what do you think are the blocks right now? Well, I think the Imperial College piece that came out really changed the UK and the US's perspective, it seems, because um, they, they got, oh, fuck, this isn't the flu, this is serious. And we collapse of ICU looks really ugly and we don't even know about conferred immunity. So the whole just naive, this is not going to be that big a deal or we all need herd immunity anyways. And we'll just call a little bit of the population. Those are just gibberish ideas. And I think that we were running on gibberish ideas. Uh, there's of course, alternate hypotheses about um, different intentions. I don't think, that it matters to speculate on that right now. I think what matters is to just get appropriate responses. And the appropriate response right now is that even though we have people in all 50 states that are infected and, but that's not evenly distributed. We still have 50% of the cases in five or six counties. 
which means that we do have to do a very smart, coordinated triaged approach. Where do we get the rate limiting gear, the diagnostics? Does it have to be equal quarantine everywhere? No, right? So what is a smart um, approach look like requires much better coordination and much faster responses than we've had. But <clears throat> as is right now, the total percentage of the population affected is still small, relatively, right? But with a three-day doubling time, that changes very quickly and you reach saturation in less than two months. Um, now, when we say reach saturation, like 70% of the population in less than two months, that's if no measures are instituted. And we can already see they're being instituted, even if not the federal government level. California just implemented a, a policy statewide and many cities are implementing at their city level. And a lot of people are voluntarily quarantining. So we're going to dampen the curve, but it needs to be dampened much more radically. So why have we not before? S some combination of miscalculating, uh, being more afraid of the economic hits and not fact calculating how bad the economic hits of it hitting catastrophic um, infection levels would be. Uh, just rampant coordination failure, um, cut resources to the areas that would normally know how to respond to this appropriately. Hmm. But I don't think, I don't want anyone focused on who did what dumb things right now, which creates more coordination failure. I want everyone working together in a nonpartisan way to just stop this. Then we can come back to domestic politics of that kind. But if we have any kind of red, blue, left, right nonsense right now, lots more people will die and the catastrophic effects will be worse. So um, this needs to be unified response within countries and between countries. They're also, obviously, viruses don't give a shit about borders. So they only care about transmission. Um, <clears throat> and so that's the other thing is that national governments cannot respond to pandemics. They can respond, but they can't solely respond. It, that requires international coordinated responses. I want to see nationwide quarantine. It's the only way to stop the spread because the spread is human to human or human to surface to human. And if you stop the social transmission, it stops. It, it's important to understand, though, that uh, viruses don't care about speeches or politics or... Um, economic interests, like they're just, it's biology, it's physics. And this is one of the things that we, you know, in, in general, there's this uh, truism that the generals who are at the top of the military during peacetime are not necessarily the ones who are best at winning wars. So when we move into wartime, sometimes they start losing battles and we kind of have to rotate through a few times till we find people like Churchill and Patton that are good at winning wars that we wouldn't necessarily want in peacetime because they aren't politicians or diplomats. Um, I see that happening now where you can, for a lot of issues that are just our social constructs, speeches and what people think and what they feel and being able to just dope the information ecology is adequate because we're just trying to move human sentiment. Viruses don't give a shit about that. So we're actually dealing with base physics again, right? And overwhelmed ICU doesn't give a shit about that. And um critical infrastructure. There's a lot of these things where it's like, oh, we're actually dealing with physics again. And so doing politics will not help. And so anyone who only knows how to do politics and is at the top because they were selected for during that time will just keep failing. And whoever knows how to actually do real physics, biology, logistics, capable stuff will get upregulated during this time. Okay. So quarantine to stop the spread. Now, I would like to see that called for at a nationwide level. I'd also like to see it called for at a statewide level because if it isn't called at the nation level, states can do that, right? I would like to see it called for by mayors at a city level. I would like to see the celebrities come out and all tell everyone using their all the channels they have, hey, stay the fuck home because right now people pay more attention to celebrities than to epidemiologists even in a life or death situation. So the celebrity should confer their celebrity power to the epidemiologists and save lives. They don't usually have the opportunity to save lives and help national security and all those things right now, the way they did before. And if they're left oriented, save lives. If they're right oriented, national security. Again, it doesn't matter. It's, a, it's the same thing on both sides at this particular point. Um, 
I'm not saying that both left and right wouldn't care about both things. I just mean whatever it is someone cares about, it's going to be the same answer here. Um, so all of the approaches that can be taken to stop social transmission should be the first order. And then in order for that to happen, we have to do the economic support and stimulus packages that the people will actually stay home and that can occur. So that means uh, stopping rents and mortgages, um, insurance that small businesses won't go out of business and other businesses that are larger businesses, but that are totally dependent upon human contact won't go out of business through tax credits, through subsidies, through whatever types of stimulus packages are needed. Um, the UBI or other kinds of food and medicine provisioning, those types of actions have to be taken. They don't all have to be taken at once because we're going to have to figure them out and they're going to have their own consequences. Um, <clears throat> president should come out and declare the key ones and say each day we'll be working on adding to this as makes sense and as we see what the needs are, but we will take care of this and so that people um, actually can stay home. And that should be seen as a patriotic duty. It should be called for as a patriotic duty. Also, in addition to be able to make the quarantine happen, not only do you need the economic support, all the people who can't be on quarantine need to uh, have the personal protective gear, hazmat gear training that they need. And so that should be an absolute top priority. And that's, we mentioned many of the areas, but you know, you can factor what those areas are, healthcare, first responders, infrastructure, utilities, et cetera. Vulnerable populations particularly need very hard quarantine measures. So the seniors facilities, the prisons, the homeless facilities, the <clears throat> immunocompromised places, those need very hard quarantines because we can't have spreading. And yeah, we can't, we can't have spreading happening within those. It'll be too much of a disaster. So those should be particularly fiercely protected. So, Next, after quarantine and all that it takes to make that happen, the focus is um, a full court press with the private sector and the government working together to ramp uh, high quality diagnostics so that we can do ubiquitous diagnostics so we can move from a total quarantine to a smart quarantine. So <clears throat> a lot of people will protest, we don't have that many tests yet, that's true or the turnaround time on the test is too slow, or there's too many false negatives, or the tests only show up after people have been sick for a while. Yes, all that's true on the tests that we've had. So when I'm saying we need to ramp up diagnostics, adequate diagnostics, what I mean is it's not a single strategy. Um, we've been collecting all of the diagnostic technology surplus, new diagnostic tech in one place so that we can be seeing which ones have the capability to get what types of things where and have a multi-pronged strategy. If there's anyone who has real capability to help that, uh, financial or logistic, please contact me. You can do that through Facebook Messenger. Um, <clears throat> but uh, so we need to get the tests that currently exist, even though they're inadequate, to all the places that need them most. So a triage to uh, the places where the most spread can occur, right? The, the following tracing of contacted individuals, the counties that have the most impact, et cetera. We need to ramp the production of tests that can be ramped in time, even if they're partial tests. Even though antibodies show up too late to, to be able to do prevention, we need antibody tests because we want to be able to see, is immunity conferred? And if so, who's immune? Because that'd be very helpful. The kind of testing that I care most about at this point is uh, testing that can detect cases as early as possible after exposure with very high sensitivity. So very low rate of false negatives, very fast turnaround time and um, not having rate limiting reagents. And this is the drive-through style testing South Korea implemented. There are a few companies that have technologies that are much better that can ramp in time, and we're working on those. Those need um, capital and support. So that, that being said, if people have that. Um, but the drive-through type testing, so let's just imagine a scenario where Walmart and Walgreens type parking lots. 
get drive through test capability so that um, somebody pulls in automatically video camera registers their license plate their driver's license gets taken they're tested if they are positive they go directly into quarantine as a result they get early treatment and they don't have to go to icu and we're able to separate a qu <clears throat> quarantine people being quarantined at home means the whole family gets it and the most vulnerable people get it so being able to have quarantine facilities where then the rest of the family is treated as exposed and we get diagnostics to them but if they haven't already all been infected they don't have to be is important um and yeah, people can get on um, early treatments and we can separate people who need to go to ICU for normal non-coronavirus reasons versus those with coronavirus and be able to separate facilities for that. We're also going to see that as the doctors and nurses get sick, but if they have access to early testing so they can get on early treatment, many of them, either because their symptoms wouldn't have been that bad anyways because they're young and healthy or because of the early treatment, we'll be able to keep working but they can't run the risk of infecting other people. So you can have the negative pressure COVID facilities and infected doctors and nurses on treatment uh, working there and uninfected doctors and nurses in the other place where people are coming in for heart attacks and strokes and other things like that. So people drive in, they go into an appropriate quarantine and response if they're positive, if they're negative, they get to park and go into Walmart and go shopping. And the pharmacies have the meds that people need, the uh, personal protective gear and Lysol and hand sanitizers provisioned through those kinds of places. Uh, the food is available. We can also see the conscription, obviously, of delivery services, Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, whatever, being Amazon capabilities in terms of delivering stuff to people to be able to help make the quarantine happen. But so what I see is that we come off of total quarantine with a smart quarantine where those who are either not infected, have never been infected, or are infected but have no more viral shedding. So we need tests that can determine total viral load. Also, if up front we can determine total viral load, we can determine how serious the case is likely to get and what kinds of treatments are warranted, factoring that the treatments have some side effect risk. Um, but also afterwards, we want to make sure that there's no more viral shedding. So when does someone come off quarantine? Well, it can't be an X number of days because there's going to be a long tail distribution of how long people are still contagious. We, it actually has to be based on adequate testing. And so then people who are either not infected or are no longer infected can go back to work and you know, off of quarantine, still with personal protective gear, social distancing, wiping down doorknobs, all those types of things, because they have to assume that some people who are infected are still out until the total case number drops to very, very low, which is exactly what China is doing and South Korea is doing. Once the total case number is very low, then life can return to normal. But this can happen in like eight to 10 weeks where we go from total quarantine to smart quarantine without a complete overwhelm. I mean, the ICU is going to be overwhelmed no matter what, but without a complete break of the medical system mm -hmm. and without a complete break of the U.S. or global economy. Um, now, if you start thinking about trillions of loss in market value and the amount of subsidy per month being in the closer to trillions type range, a meaningful percentage of a trillion, then whatever number of billions are needed to ramp the diagnostics obviously makes sense, right? To be able to go from a total quarantine where most people aren't infected to a smart quarantine where everyone infected is quarantined and the other people aren't. Um, obviously, during that time, we're also going to be ramping the ICU's capabilities and we're going to be ramping treatments. So treatments from antivirals to vaccines to ACE2 modulators to um, cytokine uh, modulators are all being developed super rapidly. And again, if we have a situation where people can get early diagnostics and then get treated and basically be fine and have very little symptoms and not go to ICU and not be intubated, that's a very different world. In a month or in two months, even in weeks, we'll have much better knowledge on treatment than we have today. We'll have more ubiquitous availability of the treatment and the logistics capability to triage and get it where it's needed. The diagnostics will be ramping. So quarantine and all the things it takes to make that happen, ramp the diagnostics to become completely ubiquitous, high quality diagnostics to move into smart quarantine. Um, 
and the ramp of treatments. If vaccines get somewhere, awesome. I'm, if the antibody transfers get somewhere, awesome, but I'm not counting on those because of mutations and the immune issues. Um, but I am expecting the treatments to be very um, effective. And then that's all dealing with the medical stuff. Then it's also ramp all of the vulnerabilities and national security type threats um, during this time, and then ramp the ability for international aid um, and paying attention to the geopolitical position that we don't become myopic. Those are the responses at a national level that I really most want to see. And as far as at a bottom-up level, we're seeing incredible responses of community self-organizing and private sector getting engaged and organizing the getting the of uh, personal protective equipment and various things to various places. But we're also seeing a lot of duplication of efforts and not great coordinating. So if anyone who has the capability and the interest to do something can look to see who's already doing it, are there groups that have good ability and more traction and join them? That would be really more helpful. Uh, if you're wanting to see how to make your city do a good job of planning, if whether you're a mayor or you're just a community leader, there are some cities that have already done a really good job, copy paste, and then also share best practices. If you're doing something for your city or your state, figure out how to share it with the other cities and states or if, for your church with the other church complexes so that we have the maximum amount of learning, sharing, least amount of duplication. So Daniel, you've been writing about and talking about systemic risk, existential risk um, for an awfully long time. We've put out quite a few films on the channel around that. So you've been warning about these topics for a long time. How are you how how are you feeling now that it does seem that we're now facing a real world example of the sort of things that you've been talking about and warning about for a long time? Well, I mean, it's it's been obvious to anyone paying attention that this was eminent. Um, I mean, Bill Gates has been talking about our susceptibility for a pandemic for quite some time. And as high profile as he has, that didn't have us get uh, prepared. And COVID didn't cause Australia to burn last month, right? Australia burned for other reasons. And we haven't seen a whole continent be decimated in a natural disaster like that in recent history. And the climate change where we had very hot, dry period and had already used up the groundwater and whatever in Australia that led to that happening uh, is the same thing that's going to cause 50 Celsius heat waves hitting India and Bangladesh that destroy crops and have vast numbers of people in um, uh, fatal circumstances just associated with that. And then does that lead to war over the scarce resources? Does that cleave along Muslim Hindu lines? Does that turn into an India-Pakistan war? Bolsonaro opened up the uh, Brazilian Amazon. Ecuador is also under massive threat at the headwaters of the Amazon. The hydrological pump of the Amazon is where a huge amount of the rainfall from North America comes from. So it's not just a South American issue and the lack of drop in the rainfall for North America would be a catastrophic collapse of North America. So it should be seen as a national security threat for North America. Um, there are so many of these issues. And so the, I'm hoping that right now people are feeling it and recognizing that, okay, Australia was actually a big deal. And this pandemic is actually a big deal. And there's actually a, the climate change mediated events and it as a force amplifier for other things is a big deal. And these aren't the same issue. It's not like there's one issue, but they're all caused by the same underlying fragile civilization structures. So the, here's the closing frame I'd like to share. That's just as simple a frame as I can. There are a lot of people that have a status quo bias or a positivity bias that doesn't want to look at negative things um, or thinks that everything will be fine or thinks that uh, risks are always overblown or something like that. And they say something to the effect of, hey, look, we have thought the rapture was coming since the 16th century, that the end was nigh. <clears throat> and Y2K was a bunch of hype and 2012 was a bunch of hype. And 
SARS and Ebola and those things were a bunch of hype. And yes, there's problems in the world, but they're less bad than they used to be. And they just drive innovation and that's the curve. I think that this perspective is complete dangerous nonsense. And it is more of a bias response than it is actually a thoughtful response because here are the factors I would like people to think about regarding the uniqueness of the time we're in now relative to all other times. And yet our intuition is conditioned and even our reason is conditioned from past experience and past time. So we have to factor that. All of the previous civilizations and previous empires died at some point. They failed, and none of them were eternal civilizations. We don't still have a Byzantine or a Egyptian or Mayan or Aztec or Roman or whatever empire. They died for reasons associated with self-induced collapse. Oftentimes, they actually cut down all the trees and um, Easter Islanded themselves or led to internal infighting that created dissent and collapse. But oftentimes, even if they were overtaken by external enemies, they were overtaken by enemies that were smaller than ones they had protected against previously because they had underwent institutional decay. So, so far, nobody has figured out how to avoid institutional decay, especially as they scale long term. So we only know how to make civilizations that collapse, various time frames. Democracies collapse on a two to 300 year time frame. The US is coming up on 250 years right, right now and we're pretty near a uh, collapse type scenario for a number of reasons. It's actually very interesting to think about the way that the US emerged as the superpower coming out of World War II that it didn't enter World War II as and the way that the European countries got radically downregulated in their relative dominance in the world um, via World War II and how easily a situation like this could do the same thing where China comes out of this the way the US came out of World War II. Um, if you want a democracy or a republic to last longer than the amount of time they've ever lasted, you have to reboot them because institutional decay does occur. So reboots are needed, which is a super important topic. But we only know how to make civilizations that collapse. But for the first time ever, we have a fully globalized civilization. So collapse means something it's never meant before. We have caused environmental damage locally that desertified the topsoil and we couldn't feed the people, but we could never actually make the entire biosphere fucked up, right? We couldn't do species extinction at scale everywhere or mess the entire oceans up or things like that. We don't have a Chinese civilization and a US civilization because if either of them fully failed, the other one would also fail because of completely dependent interconnected supply chains and um, completely interdependent biosphere type dynamics. So we are facing a collapse of a civilization or an empire, but where the scale of it is unprecedented. The next part that is really critical to get is that we have used our power either directly, militarily, in ways that cause harm, or indirectly through, in ways that cause harm through social stratification, pollution, unrenewable resource, externalities of various kinds. But we never had tech where even if we wanted to, we could fuck up everything at a global scale until World War II. That was the beginning of us having truly globally catastrophic technology. And the Romans couldn't fuck everything up if they wanted to at a global scale with the technology they had. So that's why the development of the bomb in World War II created the emergence of a world system that was completely focused on not using our new technology. And in the long arc of human history, World War II was like a second ago. And that was the beginning of us having truly globally catastrophic capabilities. So if you're using any forecasting from before that, it's nonsense in terms of what kind of harm we didn't do because we also couldn't do. Okay. The only stuff that's relevant is what kind of harm could we do and we did, <laughs> right? So then factor the new capability. So World War II. The Bretton Woods world, we made the United Nations and we made the World Bank and we made the entire set of Bretton Woods agreements and all the whole world structure to make sure that we didn't use our new technology and that the superpowers didn't fight. But through the history of the world, major empires had always fought. So we needed to do something that we had never done. 
And we were able to do that because of a few things. We were able to create debt-based finance to be able to grow the economy rapidly. So there was so much abundance, we didn't have to have scarcity-based wars. But of course, debt-based finance is unsustainable. You can't do it forever because you can't run an exponential curve on a finite planet where there's actually a materials economy that's involved forever, right? And so, but we could do it for some time. Also at the time of the Bretton, Bretton Woods solutions, we weren't near planetary boundaries anywhere. We didn't have climate change. We didn't have dead zones and oceans. We didn't have biodiversity loss. We didn't have peak phosphorus or Amazon threat or any of those things, right? And one catastrophic weapon that's very hard to make, it's very hard to enrich uranium. There's only a few places that even have uranium mines. Two superpowers that have it that can both spy on each other pretty perfectly, mutually assured destruction is possible. But today we have dozens of catastrophic weapons, not one catastrophic weapon. We have many dozens of actors that have them, including non-state actors, and many of the technologies aren't hard to produce. We have much more systemic fragility. It's important to understand that when you make something very efficient, you also make it fragile, right? If you're operating your ICU very efficiently, it can't handle spikes. If you're operating your infrastructure efficiently, it can't handle spikes. If you have a supply chain that's very efficient and you get collapse anywhere, you can get cascading collapse. If you have lots of interacting dynamics where uh, a drought somewhere leads to people having to move to already for resource scarce areas that leads to war and escalating war on already existing political tensions where larger weapons happen. Those types of cascade and amplifier scenarios um, are also unique to this time in terms of their, their scale, their connectedness. And so we have an explosion of risk happening at this time. And also in terms of exponential technology curves, as we can see with coronavirus, we are not good at having an intuition for exponential curves. Um, our intuition has never really interacted with exponential curves very much, so we're not conditioned to even notice what they are. We're used to things that have very that have more normal growth curves than that, so our intuition for timescales is quite bad. So the underlying biosphere, the underlying infrastructure, the underlying social tensions are getting more fragile. There's more interconnectivity for cascade failures and our overall impact capability is increasing exponentially. And as we can see, our intelligent coordinated responses are shitty. This is the underlying situation. We could have completely prevented this virus. Fortunately, the death percentage on this one is not that bad. So if we don't get our shit together, this will be terrible, but we can get our shit together for this and deal with it and use it to harden our capability to deal with catastrophic risks of all kinds and actually get much smarter about this issue. Because so as we're ramping our diagnostic capabilities and our response capabilities for this, we also want to be for the next round of mutation that could occur. And not just the next round of mutation for this coronavirus, but also whatever else comes next. We can see avian flus happening in factory farms around the world. Like, you know, so we want to be upregulated to pandemics, but we also want to be upregulated to all of the catastrophic risks. This one we were not prepared for, and now we're having to deal with it in real time. But had it been a Carrington event taking out the electrical grid, it, it would be so much more catastrophic. And so we can prepare for it, but we can't deal with it once it's happened. That's one of the key things. There's a lot of issues that once they've happened, that it's just really terrible. But preparing for it is doable. And so one of the lessons, hopefully, is there's a lot of shit that you just have to be prepared for ahead of time as opposed to deal with once it's occurred. This one is hopefully something that upregulates our response there and has us pay attention to systemic fragility and explosion of catastrophic risk and the inadequacy and atrophy of our overall governance systems and that neither the government mechanisms nor the market mechanisms adequately dealt with this. So we need much better collective intelligence systems to be able to deal with risks than the current ones we have. So as we are upregulating our response to this, both the immediate and the second, third, fourth order effects, we want to also be create, not making things worse like creating total monopolies 
um, by the way we wrongly engage the private sector or whatever. Um, and we want to make sure that we're setting up capacity to handle the next ones better. Daniel, thank you very much for making time. Likewise. Thank you, David. As the tech revolution continues to destroy old media, the internet is fueling a new intellectual awakening. Television made people look stupider than they were. It turns out that people are smarter with longer attention spans than we thought. I'm a journalist and filmmaker. For many years, I made documentaries for the likes of the BBC and Channel 4. But I don't think the mainstream media can provide the level of analysis and insight we need for the extraordinary times we're going through, where the old structures that made sense of the world break down. It's like we're entering, just entering into the underworld, and it's a descent. We're feeling everything starting to shake and the center cannot hold. And when our ways of thinking break down, it's the rebels and the renegades who dare to think differently, who are needed to reboot the system. Right, and so what's happening is that people are perceiving, because it's becoming increasingly obvious, that all of these artifacts of the way that we've gone about doing civilization are breaking down and failing in a way that is no longer easy to pretend isn't happening. And so as a consequence, this triggers a deep visceral sense. And that's a good thing, right? Because that deep visceral sense is the return to the liminal the return to the mystery. The shift that we are on the precipice of is not like the shift from the dark ages to the enlightenment. It's like more like a shift from single cell to multicellular life. These are the people and ideas rebel wisdom is searching out to try to make sense of the growing chaos. Evolution screwed up. It handed us the tools to recognize that we don't have to value the game that it is playing and that we can now repurpose the hardware to something that's actually worthwhile. That's what I actually have hope in, is that if, if enough people can come to that realization, then, then we wake up, and not in some bullshit evangelical megachurch kind of way of being born again, but in a, in a truly initiatory way, being born again of like, I know my purpose, I know my part and I'm willing to practice resurrection. I'm willing to offer my life fully and freely, in love, in every moment. And then we're invincible. Like then we can turn things on a dime. It's also about trying to create a new form of conversation, one based on genuine dialogue, letting go of ideology and fixed ideas. So we want to be a place that hosts this new form of conversation, both online and at our events. Check out our films, join the conversation and to get early access to some great films and exclusive content please consider supporting us on patreon